But turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. We're going to go into the Old Testament a little bit here. If you don't know where it is, look in your Bible and, and at two-thirds, two-thirds of the way through, open it up. You'll probably be in Ezekiel. It's just one book to the right of that. Daniel. Uh, we talked about Revelation. We talked about that Babylon fell. And when we talked about Babylon, we talked about the world system, that there's a religious system in place that puts itself in the spot of God. The people will gra gravitate towards religion rather than a personal relationship with God. There's also the world system that will occupy you with um, the idea or the promise of fulfillment. And if you just get the, the right husband or wife in the right house, live on the right cul-de-sac, have 1.5 children, um, have a cabin, well, that's average. That's what makes you happy, 1.5 children. Um, that there's this, like, American dream. Well, that American dream extends around the world. In fact, you could say that um, the United States of America is kind of like the number one exporter of a Babylonian kind of idea. The rest of the world looks at us and they think that it's Dallas or Dynasty or one of these soap operas that shows everybody's rich and famous and good-looking and... So when you go overseas, people think that that's what America is. It's not. It's not that, for one thing. But besides that, what you'll find is those things don't bring happiness. Just like religion doesn't bring happiness. So we saw that in Revelation, the whole Babylonian system comes down. Well, now we're talking about real Babylon. The real historic Babylon. And it's when the children of Israel were defeated after 490 years of not honoring God consistently. Finally, they fell to the country of Babylon. And so it's the same Babylon. It's the same attractive... Let's put it this way. A lot of um, cultures would like to defeat and rub their enemies' nose in it and just destroy their enemies completely. Babylon would come in and besiege a town and they'd get them to um, surrender and they would take the best. They'd take the best of the food, take the best of the clothing, take the best of the jewels and, and all of the natural resources... And then they would take the youth, teenagers. They would say, we want the royal teenagers, the good-looking teenagers, the intelligent teenagers, because that is the number one natural resource of any people. When you look at the Babylonian system that we have going in America, what's the target? Teenagers. They want the youth. And they're trying to indoctrinate youth. And rather than plow them under submission, or destroy them. They're trying to corrupt them. And so what we see is these guys get taken from Babylon. And they're brought across a desert. And they must be wondering what's going on. It's a very dry place. But when you entered Babylon back then, they had like 200 foot walls, 40 foot at the top, 300 foot wide. That chariot races around Babylon. Around the top of the wall. When you open up the wall, here was the hanging gardens of Babylon. It was the most green, lush thing you've ever seen in your life. So somebody being brought into Babylon would think, wow, these guys really have it going on. And they were tempted by the culture. They were tempted by the setting. They were tempted by, they were told they were the best and the brightest. And then they were trained for three years and put in the royal court given all the best food, all the best wine. What they were trying to do was turn them into Babylonians so they could rule for Babylon around the world. Babylon says, if we can get all the, the cream of the crop of all the cultures and put them here in a pile, we'll be a world empire forever. And that's the system that we see. And, and there's two kingdoms in this world. There's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of Babylon. And if you look up, the next place that we'll go in the Bible after we're done with Daniel is in Matthew. And I, I love Matthew because it starts out with the genealogy of Christ. But Christ on the Mount of Olives, or I should say the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in chapter 5 of Matthew, and it's chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. It's the longest passage of Jesus' teaching in the Bible. So it's probably pretty good when you think if Jesus is teaching for a long time, we can probably sit down and go, let's take some notes. And it starts out with, 
Blessed are those who are poor, for they realize they need him. Or blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which are do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil things against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So this blessed is, blessed, 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 blessed. That is our, our modern word, happy. Happy are you if these are the things. And so what he's doing is he's giving us the character traits, the character of the new kingdom, of his kingdom, which is opposite of the world. Like he wouldn't say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Who wants to have a poor spirit? Well, poor in spirit means I don't have what it takes to fulfill myself. I have a need. I have a spiritual need inside of me. Did you know this is the first step of AA? The Beatitudes are the basis of all the AA principles. They pulled them out and went, hey, if we use these, people might be happy. Then they wouldn't feel the need to drink. It's worked pretty well for them. Now they leave out Jesus nowadays. They say higher power. I, I met a guy who was in AA for 30, 40 years, and he said, the only people who stay sober are the people that know that the higher power is Jesus. He said, that's our little secret. <laughs> like, well, I don't know what I think about that, but hey, whatever keeps you sober, whatever, how are we going to find Jesus? We see this. This is like an upside down kingdom where we say bless, bless, bless. And some Christians don't like the word happy because the world has stole the, world, the word happy. But I'm not giving the world happy. I'm not giving them the word love. I'm not giving them the rainbow. I'm keeping all those for me. The Lord wants us to be happy. The Lord wants us to be joyful. The Lord wants us to know what real love is and talk about love. The Lord wants us to have the promise of the rainbow. We're not going to cede those to the world because they try to steal them and distort them. True happiness comes from being right with God. And so after he talks about these characters of the kingdom, he says, But you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost the savor, whereas shall it be salted? It therefore is good for nothing to be, to, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick to give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So that's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is he wants us to be salt, light, and a city on a hill. And that's exactly opposite of the Babylonian system which the world is running. And a lot of Christians get upset because we see that Babylon is rising and the world that we were born into is dying. And they get upset and they're like, what, how are we going to act? What are we going to do? How are we going to take things back? And the Bible tells us strictly in Daniel how we do that. Because you have these four boys, these four young men. It's not only four out of all the, they took thousands. These four representatives of the men that went to Babylon. It picks them out because they were distinct. They purposed in their heart not to be corrupted by the kingdom of this world. They purposed in their heart that they were going to be different. They were going to remain distinct. And they had every reason not to. I want you to, this is something we have to purpose in our heart that we're going to be different in the world. That we're not going to react the way the world reacts. We're not going to despair the same way they despair. We're not going to be angry the way that they're angry. We're not going to be fearful the way that they're fearful. We have to be different than the world. Distinctly different so that we are salt, light, and city on a hill. And what stops us from doing that usually is excuses. Well, you don't know what I've been through. 
This isn't my fault. It could have been different, you know. If only things were different. If only I hadn't had childhood trauma. If only, you know, my wife hadn't left me or my husband hadn't left me or I hadn't gotten this accident or if I was born in a different family or if, 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 if. When you get good at making excuses, that's all you're going to be good at. Period. My, my kids get so tired of hearing me say that. <laughs> when you get good at making excuses, that's all you're going to be good at. And think about these kids. Through no fault of their own, they're captured and taken to a foreign land. There was a king named Hezekiah. And he was a good king, but he was supposed to die. And he begged God to make him live. Lord, I don't have any heirs. Will you let, let me live? And, and when he recovered, the Lord granted him that. When he recovered, he was so happy. And all these kingdoms came and were congratulating him on, him on recovery. When the Babylonians came, he said, come here, I'll show you all my stuff. So he showed him all the riches, showed him all the treasures, showed him everything. And the prophet Isaiah said, who are those guys and what did you just do? He said, they're Babylonians. They're from far away. We don't have to worry about them. I showed them all the treasures, everything I got. And I, Isaiah said, that's ridiculous. You should have never done that. Do you know that they're going to take your sons captive? They're going to be eunuchs in the court. They're going to be serving the Babylonians. He goes, oh, you mean after me? He said, yeah, after your lifetime. That's what's going to happen. He goes, well, good. At least it won't happen in my lifetime. Short-sighted. Short he, he got in his flesh. He got short-sighted. But this is a direct, a hundred years later, his offspring are now being taken to the court of the Babylonians and the eunuchs. That means castrated, right? So these boys have been castrated, taken from home, and now they're going to be serving in someone else's kingdom. Now, isn't that a built-in excuse? What couldn't you just say? Yeah, wait. We don't expect anything out of you. You've had a tough break in life. Through no fault of your own, you got taken captured. You got taken captive. Through no fault of your own, you were castrated. Your future is down the tubes. From the circumstances we can see in these boys' lives, their lives are over and done, and they have every reason to mail it in. I, I don't know about anything. I, I mean, I prayed, and he still took me captive. I prayed and I still got castrated. I prayed them still captive in this foreign court. After a way of human thinking, that is correct. In the big picture of God's plan, that's ridiculous because God has a bigger plan than that. Your life is bigger than your own. You play a part in the big scheme of things, in the meta narrative of the Bible, you have no idea. He picked you for this time and place. It doesn't matter how you came in here, what speed, what angle, what injuries, what past, he still has a plan for your life. It's a beautiful thing. We're going to see these, these guys triumph. I'll give you a state preview. Now maybe we should just read it. Wait, we'll just read it. Let's just, I'll just stop talking. And we'll start reading the Bible. How about that? More Bible, less rich. Chapter 1, verse 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah, who permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia, or Shinar, and placed them in the treasure house of his God. So he took the... the beautiful things from the temple and put them in his own temple. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who have been brought to Babylon as captive. Select only the strong, the healthy, the good-looking young men, and make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning. They're gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and they are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained three years 
and then they would enter royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff permission not to eat the unacceptable foods. So we see that, first of all, there's a siege. They don't destroy the city. They just starve them out and they surrender. And so they say, okay, we surrender. So they took all of their good stuff and they took all these kids with them. And then it says in verse 2, it says, The Lord gave him victory. The Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over Israel. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah, the prophet, had been predicting this for years. And saying, he's going to come. We need to surrender. God has prescribed the punishment for us. We need to take it. So initially they surrendered. Then they rebelled again. He besieged them again. They surrendered. Then they rebelled again. And he destroyed the city, just raised it. Three different waves went to Babylon. They went to Babylon with three waves of, of destruction each time. And then they came back to the to the land seventy years later, three waves of, after three waves. So it wasn't like this big clump of people went to Babylon and then this big clump of people came back. They went three waves, they came back in three waves. A lot more went and came back. We see he took the cream of the crop because the youth are a resource. I want you to know that if you're young and you have something you're talented in, the world has a place for you. They want you to use all your talent on yourself and them to build their kingdom. God has a different plan for you to use your, what he's given you for his kingdom and his welfare. The world took these boys and they said, you're the cream of the crop. You're no. So he worked on their egos, right? And then he also um, separated them from their culture. Also indoctrinated them into the ways of Babylon. And then they put, fitted them with golden chains. You know what golden chains are? They made life so easy for them, it would be hard for them to rebel. How many of us are trapped in golden chains? Our luxuries and the things that we love, so much so we can't move anymore. You have to be careful about what chains you accept. They, um, then they rename them. Their names are all godly names, and they turn them all into pagan names. Every one of their names were honoring to God. They took every one of their names, and they're honoring to a pagan God. They told these boys they could be all they could be, like the army, right? You know what they did to me when I was in the army? They took all my hair away from me. <laughs> oh, wait a second. This, is, this looks like my army haircut. Not this part. So they take away all your hair, they take away your civilian clothes, they put you in a different culture, they indoctrinate you in the way they were thinking, because they're trying to turn you into something. Did you know that? And this is a, a common technique. This is what they were doing. They were trying to take them, but your name that you have for you remains inside of you. God has a name for you. God has a place for you. He has a purpose for you. And the world's trying to conform you into their way. But you can stay if you purpose in your heart. But Daniel purposed in his heart. He said, I'm determined that my life is for the one above. And that's what we have to do in in our own lives. Is each day that goes by, we have to say, this one's for the Lord, this one's for the Lord, this one's for the Lord. Because the world is constantly trying to feed you something else. Other than that. God's kingdom and the world's kingdom, God's kingdom is upside down, right? Like if you take all the world's principles, basically you could write a Bible if you just took what the world says and turned it backwards. The way up is the way down. Like Jesus said, the way you get to be somebody big or a leader in heaven is to wash feet. 
to be the servant of all. That's not the way it works in the world, is it? Look out for number one and don't step in number two. That's what I always heard. You know, get them before they get you. Do one to others, then run real fast. You know, different. It says, um, Daniel spoke. Wait a second. In verse 9 it says, Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who orders that you eat this food and drink this wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths of your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. The king had this prescriptive program, right? And Daniel's asking him to get off the program. What's he going to tell the king if these guys don't look good? Well, I know that's what you commanded, king, but I decided to do it different than you. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't take very well to that. He has um, these three friends of his thrown into the furnace when they won't do what he says. He's a hothead. Nebuchadnezzar is a hardcore guy. He's seriously hardcore, and this guy doesn't want to doesn't want to define. It says Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Dan, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for ten days on a diet of vegetables and water. Daniel said, "At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other men who are eating the king's food." Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the, five, than the other young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for, by the, for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the other magicians and enchanters in the entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. That's 70 years. Now, I just want to highlight some things as we go through that passage. Despite um, their circumstances and having every reason to quit, they did the small things. Well, the thing that you feed yourself constantly will be the thing that will be how you grow. If you feed yourself the things of the world, if you feed your appetites with the things of the world, then you will have worldly outcomes. If you feed yourself godly things, you'll have godly outcomes. This is a very simple principle. But I am surprised sometimes, and I shouldn't say I'm surprised because even in my own life, if I find I don't have a hunger for scripture, I don't have a hunger for prayer, I don't have a hunger for fellowship, why do you suppose that is? People ask me, I just want to, but I just don't have a hunger for it. And I always I always throw myself under the bus and sometimes, well, Angie makes great meals all the time, right? But what if I stop off at Quick Trip? get a couple of fish sandwiches on Friday before I go home. How hungry am I going to be for her fine meal? Eh, I'm not so hungry for it. Why? Because I've satiated myself. I've filled myself up with junk. Yeah, quick food is good, but it's junk, right? So when you fill yourself up with junk, you don't have a hunger for the things of the Lord. If you feel, if you're hungry, if your inner soul is always hungry, it's wanting something. And some of us shop. And some of us post on Facebook. Some people have drugs and alcohol. Other people eat food. You know, we fill those needs. Like maybe we call all our friends. Maybe we text certain, you know, we're like, antsy, let me text somebody. I'm antsy, let me buy something. I'm antsy, let me eat something. I'm antsy, maybe I should have a drink. We all 
all have hungers. You know what you're really hungry for? God above. Custom made us. He's tailor made us for him. He's the only one that truly fulfills us because those other things fulfill for a little while. Then they have some negative consequence to them. So we fill ourselves with those things, then it falls through. Then it falls through. Then it falls through. We need to fill our, to fill ourselves with the things of the Lord. And how you do the small things is how you'll do the big things. They started out with food. These guys later on are like, Daniel's prophecies are so profound. They are used as proofs that the book of Daniel is not real. Did you know that? That sounds weird, doesn't it? What, it? what is found in this book is so profound that experts look at it and go, there's no way he could have wrote that. It's too impossible to even know these things. He wrote the future like he was looking at it. You know, it's funny because miracles and prophecy is what God uses to authenticate his book. The world will use the same thing to not believe the book. So it was filled with miracles and prophecies. Ridiculous. Isn't that funny how the thing that can be used to prove? You know, but it's funny because I always, this is my favorite example, is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a well-documented historical fact. So much so that lawyers have went and said, what's admissible in court, what's not admissible in court? What would be easier to prove? That Jesus resurrected from the dead, when he was a historical figure, the resurrected from the dead, or that George Washington was our first president. Did you know it's easier to prove in court that Jesus was resurrected from the dead than it is to prove that George Washington was our first president? From a, from a legal standpoint, what's admissible in court? I mean, we have all kinds of documentation, historians, eyewitnesses, that Jesus rose from the grave. But you know what? Nobody doubts that George Washington was our first president. And no one's ever tried to disprove it. Why? It's easier to disprove that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Why is no one ever trying to prove that? You know what? Because whether he was our first president or not makes no difference to you morally. You can live your life however you want to. If George Washington was or wasn't our first president. If Jesus Christ was resurrected? Oh boy. That means something to you, doesn't it? That has moral implications. That's why people attack it. That's why they want to destroy it. Because they don't want to believe it. Daniel is so profound that people say, it couldn't have been Daniel because he was alive, you know, like 300 years before these things came to pass. And these miracles, you can't believe miracles. But I want you to know that when he decided to live differently than the world, how did he do it? Did he like raise a, a flag and a banner and go do a protest inside the royal court? <laughs> I'm not doing what you say. No, he picked his battles. He said, I won't do this. But I want you to notice, he said, test us. Test us for 10 days and I'll do whatever you say. He found favor in the sight of the people around him. I've known Christians that got fired from jobs because they were witnessing. That's what someone, that's what they told me. Then I talked to the boss, you know what the boss said? Guy wouldn't work, all he wanted to do was sit around and talk. Oh. That's not a very good testimony, is it? I've known other I've known other Christians who've worked for a place, they had a godly influence, and if they wanted to take three months off to go on a missions trip, the boss went, Whatever you gotta do, when you come back there'll be a job for you. That's the way a Christian's supposed to behave. You're supposed to be of some use to the world. You're supposed to garner favor the, for the people that you work with. You want the only offense that you have to your employer or your employees or anyone else in life is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That guy is a wonderful dude. I just wish he'd be quiet about Jesus. That's what I want put on my gravestone. <laughs> He's a good guy except for that Jesus thing. You just want to be quiet about Jesus. You want, to, you want someone to say, that guy... He's kind, considerate, conscientious, honest, trustworthy, friendly, generous. I mean, all of, you, you want him to be all that. But don't sacrifice the gospel. That's our job. He 
He was humble about it. And again, they were ten times better than the other magicians. And when I say other magicians, that's where they were lumped into. Did you know that? They were lumped into this wise court where other people were studying the occult. These guys said, I know about all that. You know what I really specialize in? Jehovah God. I'm not afraid of the alternative religions. Stack them up. I like, I, sometimes, when, sometimes when people try to present them to me, I'm like, go ahead. I go, well, here's the deal I got. And I explain to them the deal I have. He says, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm worthy of hell. And that Jesus Christ has forgiven me of everything and given me a job to do in representing him to the people around the world. Like, so improve on that for me. They're like, well, we got nothing. The, the world's got nothing for me. Alternative religions have nothing for me. And I want to be ten times better. Now, what makes you ten times better? Um, I want you to know it's God's supernatural power that does that. And I was talking with them someone the other day, and they brought up some really profound points. And I look at Philippians chapter 2, and verse 12. It says, Dear friend, you always follow my instructions when I was with you. This is Paul talking to the people in Philippi. It says, now that I'm away, it is even more important that you work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. So he's telling them to work hard to show who you are. So we're, so we're supposed to work hard. That It's our job to work hard, right? What's God's part? The next verse said, says, for it is God working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So which is it, God or me? Which one? Yes. Yes, that's what it is. It's God in you. You'll say, well, I just, I just love God so much and I'm just not going to do a darn thing about it. You're going to sit here and do nothing. You know, you clock in the work. I just love God. It's like, get busy. God wants us to work hard so that people will will see what we're doing and glorify him in heaven. Now, so, so it's just me, right? No, it says God is working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. He gives you the motivation and the ability. And it says, the next verse, I love it. Like, what does that look like? Do everything without complaining and arguing. Work hard, but don't complain and argue. Because sometimes we have hard workers when I worked hard, and I wasn't following the Lord like I should, I worked hard, but there was debris around me. There was a, <laughs> a, a, a funk around me that would get in my way. I used anger to motivate myself, and I hope you don't get in the way when I'm angry and I'm working. But God says to everything without complaining and arguing. And then it says, that so that no one can criticize Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life that one day, on the day of Christ's return, I would be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice, even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share in your joy. So he's saying is, if you work like this, like you do your part. You work as hard as you can. Let God bless you completely. You will be blessed. You will have joy. So I say do this because it's your Christian service and it's your Christian duty, right? And God's saying yes, it's true. But you will never be happy in this life trying to please yourself. That's not the way God designed you. You will only be happy and content and full of joy if you sell out for him. If you lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. But if you try to hold on for your life, you'll lose it. So, we see that they're ten times better in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through the end of the chapter there says, hey, you do what you're supposed to do and God will do what he's supposed to do. Now, what we also see with these guys is there's no secular in sacred. Do you know what I mean when I say secular? That means worldly. Like sometimes we go, well, that doesn't have anything to do with God. That's just what I 
do in the world. Whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. You know that? Whatever you do, I don't care if you're mowing the lawn, mow a little extra. Give it that little extra. And God will do that for you. Whatever you're doing, do extra. It says, um, he also had peers. He didn't do this alone. He didn't fly solo. Do you notice that? He found people around him that felt like he did. As we get ready to pass out the communion elements, I think that's important. That as, a, that as a group of people, we remember that God manufactured something. He made something called the church. It is his mechanism. It is his organism to get things done in the world. As we read in Revelation, he could send angels around. Just orbit the earth and tell the gospel, couldn't he? God can do it any way he wants to. He can use visions, dreams, angels. But you know what he picks? You and me. And he puts us in a group. He says to us, when in Revelation, he says, you know, I'm going to drink this wine again one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb. When he was with his disciples, he says, I won't drink this again until that day. And so as we get together and do this, we want to remember him. For communion speaks of one of two things. If you're not saved, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, then don't take communion. Just, you know, let the elements pass you by. This is basically, as we do baptisms today, baptism is to show what God's already done. Um, that's the question I always ask kids or ask adults. Well, if you get baptized today, you'll be more saved, right? And they're like, no. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> yeah, but it'll seal your salvation. No. What is, what is baptism? It's a public celebration saying, I'm identifying with Christ. And that's so neat to me that kids want to do this because kids go, I want to do it. I know adults that they won't get baptized. Why? Because they have a lot of different reasons. I might, my reasoning with that is always, you know who got baptized? Jesus did. Why did Jesus have to get baptized? Wash his sins away? To identify himself with himself? No, a simple obedience. He did it as an example. Why would I do this as, a, as an adult? Obedience. A simple example. Me identifying with the body of Christ. Why wouldn't I want to do it? Well, I might look ridiculous. I wouldn't be comfortable with that. There's no good reason not to be baptized if you're a believer. But if you don't, you're not going to get I won't take away your salvation. I thought you were supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> Nobody can take away anybody's salvation. Not any less saved. It's just something that you're not celebrating. And it's like, I always think to myself when a, when a guy wants to get married, he goes, yeah, I really don't want the ceremony. It's just a piece of paper. Um, you know, we're married in the eyes of God anyways. Everyone knows. What do you think of that? If I was a girl, I know what I'd think of it. <laughs> Same way, if a guy wants to get married, they go, well, no, 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 we're married in the eyes of God, and we just don't need to get married. And we don't need a celebration. Why not? I say the thing, same thing about baptism. Why not? Don't you want to celebrate? But it's the same way of communion. Communion doesn't save us. Communion is a time of reflection. It's a time for us to look around and go, wow, this is my family. These are my people. We're going to eat this together and remember Christ together because God has brought us together graciously. I love that this place is called a fellowship. Because a fellowship has an idea of equals that grow from each other, that learn from each other, that come and go. There's no ownership here. The church doesn't own you. There's no official membership. It's a fellowship of believers. It's a fellowship. We come in and we bless each other and are blessed by each other. When we come together and we have, you know, our third week, we have potluck and some chicken today. Yeah. We hot dogs. That's right, Barrett. Hot dogs. I bet he eats a dozen. <laughs> then we look together and we go, hey, we're all sharing the same bread and we're all sharing.
carrying this thing. Why not? It, it loses its effect here because the disciples all passed around the cup, right? So some of y'all couldn't have had communion upstairs. So you're like, oh, I don't drink after someone else. They shared a cup. What gross. They shared bread. You know why? Because like, your germs are my germs. We're family here. And that's what it is. We're saying we're family here. We love each other. And we, we, we honor God together. We don't ever forget that when we come together, this is, this is a gift. This is, this is what God's given us. And this is, this, is, I, this is not fake communion. But I always say real communion is when we actually eat together. Because that's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. They're all sitting around eating like potluck. So when we experience potluck at the picnic, and any of you are welcome to come. There's, like I said, there's directions on the back table. It's just a time of celebration. There's just not membership or anything else. Just come out and visit with us. Enjoy us. And enjoy each other. But on the night that he was betrayed, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And the body is like our body, right? This, we're the body of Christ now. This is broken for you. So that you can be healed. So you can be whole. He said, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. For one is for salvation. The other is for communion. And when you say communion, it's community. So let's take an eat. Feed your own soul. Reach out to the souls around you. 